This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you Episode 11 of Season 2 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, March 13th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago as we read. The first section in, uh, on March 13th was the Graniteville section. At the 9.45 o'clock Mass in St. Catherine's Church on last Sunday morning, Reverend Edmund T. Schofield preached an eloquent sermon on temperance, which was timely and pointed a good moral lesson for the parishioners to follow. He left no doubt as to his position on the license question, and his remarks will long be remembered. At this time, Father... Schofield made public a letter from Miss Bunce, librarian of the J.V. Fletcher Library in Westford, stating that the library officials would be pleased to furnish reading matter to be left at the rooms of St. Catherine's Temperance Society in this village. The kindness is greatly appreciated, not only by the pastor and parishioners of St. Catherine's Church, but by the members of the Temperance Society as well. Reverend Mr. Taylor of West Chelmsford officiated at the services of the in the Methodist Episcopal Church on Sunday, and with Mrs. Taylor were the guests of Mr. and Mrs. W. C. Wright of this village during the day. Uh, Reverend Francis D. Taylor, uh, no relation to the Taylor family of Westford, was the former pastor of the West Chelmsford Methodist Church uh, from 1906 to 1908. The Ladies' Aid Society of the M.E. Church met with Mrs. Wesley O. Hawks on Thursday afternoon. That's a reference to the Westford Methodist Episcopal Church, which was located in Graniteville and still is. There will be an entertainment given in Abbott's Hall, Forge Village, on March 17th for the benefit of St. Catherine's Church. The members of the Temperance Society have changed their original plan somewhat and are now preparing for a minstrel show to be given after Lent. P. Henry Harrington and Andrew Johnson, both of this village, are the opposing candidates for the Office of Selectmen to be voted for at the annual town meeting March 15th. Wallace W. Johnson, who supplies the different villages in this vicinity with ice during the summer months, has been harvesting his annual crop at Burgess Pond during the past few days and hopes to have sufficient for all needs. The sympathy of the village people is extended to Mr. and Mrs. William Pine in the loss of their youngest daughter, 16-year-old Miss Ollie Pine, who died at her parents' home at Pine Ridge Station on Tuesday morning, March 9th, after a few days' illness. The next uh, section is called The Unitarian Sociable. Good, better, best seems to be the verdict of the patronizing public as a proper grading of the monthly sociables at the, uni- at the Unitarian Vestry, the last one being held last week Friday evening. Delighted why, why that is a mild way to express the satisfaction that was photographed in the attitude of those who attended the social. There is lots of music and other values locked up in the congregation of the old First Parish Church. Let us turn the key and unlock for the public entertainment some of the treasures of this last sociable. Violin and piano duets were given by Mabel Miller and Everett Miller. Farce in two acts... Uh, entitled Not a Man in the House. This was originally laughable, so much so that had never you that had never you laughed style of living be, been present, it would have been out of style and been compelled to acquiesce in the new and liberating princ- principle of laughter. The characters were entertainingly sustained by May Balch, Gertrude Bartlett, Ruth Miller, Mrs. W. L. Woods, and Mrs. Alonzo Sutherland. They all did fine, finest, and funniest. The next turn of the key for hidden treasures brought out a dialogue between Miss May and Agnes Balch on the subject, how she made him propose. This proved to be fun, uncaged, running loose in everybody's pathway, a real liberator from the eight headache cares. May Balch, in the character of a gentleman trying to pop the question under the hindering difficulties, was a sort of star wonder and entertainer of the evening. 
Those in charge of the social were Mrs. Spaulding, Mrs. Woods, Miss May Balch, uh, Candy Table, Mary Morn, Eva Fletcher. Dancing and other variations were administered in proper adjustment to individual needs. $22 without any of the about, more or less limitations attached to it, just the, just the straight even dollars. I might mention that May Balch, uh, who, who was mentioned here several times, was a very artistic lady. Uh, she was not only uh, somewhat of an actress, but a quite good uh, artist, and a number of her pieces of artwork can be found uh, within the town and at the Westford Museum. The next uh, section is called Encircled the Globe. The people of Graniteville are taking an unusual interest in the return of the United States fleet that has just encircled the globe, owing to the fact that a Graniteville boy, W. Carroll Furbush, son of Mr. and Mrs. Frank Furbush, is numbered among the Blue Jackets, he being a machinist on the Nebraska. Young Furbush enlisted in the Navy at Boston June 24, 1907. Shortly after, he was sent to Norfolk, Virginia, and from there was sent to Bremerton, Washington, where he joined the crew of the, of the Nebraska. After stopping a while on the Pacific Slope, the, the Nebraska joined the fleet at San Francisco and made a tour of the world as a member of the, quote, Sweet, sweet 16. These were, end quote, these were uh, the 16 battleships in the fleet. Carroll has written frequently to his parents here and appears to be greatly pleased with his position. He says the Navy is the only thing for a young man to get into, for, as he puts it, quote, it will make a man of you, end quote. His pay has been advanced since his enlistment, and he is getting along finely. The ships are now at Hampton Roads, Virginia, and as soon as he has the opportunity, he will visit his relatives and friends here. Young Furbush is but 20 years of age, has served over one year, and will be but 23 years old when his four years term has expired. He is very fond of the water, and it is possible he may enlist again. Uh, I have a few comments on the Nebraska. It was one of the 16 battleships with their escorts in the great, what was called the Great White Fleet that President Theodore Roosevelt sent around the world as a demonstration of American military power and the capability of our Navy. The fleet left Hampton Roads on December 16, 1907, made stops at Trinidad, British West Indies, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, sailed through the Straits of Magellan, stopped in Chile, Peru, Mexico, and San Francisco on May 6, 1908. It was here that the Nebraska, uh, designated BB-14, was added to the fleet. It was launched at Seattle on October 7, 1904, and was commissioned July 1, 1907. The fleet left San Francisco July 7, 1908, making stops at Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia, the Philippine Islands, Japan, and Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. The fleet went through the Suez Canal, stopped at Italy and Gibraltar in the Mediterranean, and arrived back at Hampton Roads on February 22, 1909. Roosevelt reviewed the fleet as it arrived. During World War I, Nebraska made four trips to Brest, France, transporting 4,540 troops to and from the U.S. She was decommissioned July 2, 1920, and sold for scrap in 1923. The next section is the Westford Grange. There was a good attendance present at the Grange Thursday evening, for there was a live topic down on the program for discussion and a vital interest to many residents of the town. The question was, quote, is the closing of the district schoolhouse a blow to the rural community, end quote. Samuel L. Taylor sustained the negative of the question, and Mrs. Joseph E. Knight followed with a paper, which was an emphatic decision in the affirmative. The recent closing of the Minot's Corner School and transporting the scholars to the new Frost School in the center was a matter of much concern to Mrs. Knight and others in that vicinity, and necessarily the discussion was decidedly local in tone. Both sides of the question were well sustained and much of interest brought out. 
while we all recognize that the schoolhouse in the outlying district is a center of life and interest, and its elimination takes away just that much of life and interest, and for which we cannot but feel sorry for those directly concerned. Yet there is much to be said in favor of a central school, and Mr. Taylor endeavored to show in his remarks the value of the system after some of the con conservatism that is always encountered toward any radically new movement had been overcome. The depreciation in the value of farm property and the harmful effect it might have on the health of the children were two of the strong factors dwelt upon in disfavor of the new system. Many took part in the discussion that followed, and what was left of the lecturer's hour was taken up with discussing some of the articles in the town warrant. Usually when they have a debate, they say uh, who won the debate, the affirmative or the negative, and they don't do that in this instance. The next section is the Westford Center section. Members of the Tadmunk Club will remember that the hour of meeting, Tuesday, March 16th, is changed from 2.30 to three at Library Hall. The second of the special midweek Lenten prayer services took place at the Congregational Vestry last Wednesday evening with a good attendance. Mr. Osgood led the singing and Reverend Mr. Hudson of North Chelmsford gave a helpful and inspiring address. There was a good congregation Sunday morning. Mr. Marshall's theme was true success and was well elucidated. At the evening service, Mr. Marshall conducted a preaching service and Mr. Osgood a praise service from the Alexander Songbook. Dr. Orion V. Wells has purchased the property of the late Dr. Sleeper at 29 Main Street. Uh, when, when I give uh, street numbers, uh, those are, were not available in 1909. Uh, we did not get street numbers, I think, until the 1940s or 50s, or maybe the 1930s, but not before that. So those are the current the number of the current house at that site. The next section is about town. Frank D. McGlinchey, who met with a serious accident several weeks ago while clearing away the ruins of the burned mill at North Chelmsford, has recovered sufficiently to leave the Lowell Hospital for his home at Westford Corner. The J. Murray Chamberlain place at Chamberlain's Corner had been leased to Everett Ward of Lowell. Mr. Ward is at present in the employ of Arthur G. Boynton and collects milk in Westford for the Lowell market. Chamberlain's Corner is the intersection of uh, Main Street and Chamberlain Road uh, on the kind of east side of Westford, not too far from the Chelmsford line. The heavy rain of a week ago caused a small landslide on the Stony Brook Railroad at the corner near Westford Station. Both rails were covered with the debris. Fortunate that the obstruction was soft as a fast-running freight plowed right through it, the sharp curve preventing any opportunity to stop before colliding. The next section is called Accident. Monday morning, while John J. Dunn was sawing wood with a gasoline engine for CRP Decatur, his coat sleeve came in contact with the saw, drawing his arm against the saw, shaving the flesh nearly to the bone. Fortunately, that the arm had a sidewise contact with the saw instead of crosswise, which would certainly have resulted in amputation. The accident was caused by Mr. Dunn reaching down and sidewise of the saw to clear a collection of sawdust that obstructed the wood from coming in contact with the saw. Mr. Dunn was quickly removed to his home in West Chelmsford, and doctors Varney and Gage summoned. No ill effects other than painful endurance are anticipated. The next section is called Thieving. A brief summary of the avocation of thieving carried on within a few weeks in town might serve as a public guideboard in a small way, not only as a look out for your turn next, but as a possible trail to locate the headquarters of the industry, not to go so far back as the horse stealing epidemic, but more recently burglarizing the house of Mrs. George Drew on the Boston Road, thence southerly towards Parkerville, stealing a double barreled shotgun and about $10 worth of furs, thence countermarching northerly to the J.V. Fletcher Library and taking up a collection amounting to about $8, 
from the money drawer for the benefit of midnight operatives, thence easterly to the academy, where the principal currency was in Greek and Latin, not being able or willing to inter- interpret it into a hurry-up cash basis, the trail is now northeast to the farm buildings of Charles W. Whitney on the Lowell Road, where a nearly new harness was removed from the barn, thence southeast to the farm of Evan Prescott on Main Street, opposite Chamberlain's shop, uh, that was right near Chamberlain's Corner also, where this midnight visitor of the skunk variety of humanity resolved to go into the poultry business with Mr. Prescott and his poultry as silent partners. This trail, although covering several weeks and widely apart localities and very desires, buried, bears some evidence of one dictation. It is evidently not the work of a literary genius so thirsting for knowledge that the library and the academy academy must be worked like an industrial overtime bill. The foundations of literary institutions do not tally with the trapping of hunters, but the cash drawer does. The next section is called Unitarian. Both hopeful and helpful are the recent additions to the choir of the Unitarian Church, uh, what we call the First Parish Church. And the lonesomeness of the situation for man has been agreeable, agreeably relieved by the presence of John Feeney Jr., Ray Hamblin, Everett Miller, Frank J. Johnson. While not so noticeable because not so lonesome the situation, yet equally as valuable and appreciative have been the more gradual additions to the softer and higher altitudes of the choir, either in solo, duet, or chorus, in the tuneful chiming of the voices of Miss Anna Drew, Miss Grace Bennett, Miss Gladys Fletcher, the Misses Mabel and Ruth Miller, and Mrs. Virgil Mitchell. The young and active of the Unitarian per- Parish are preparing an entertainment to be given Friday, March 26th at the Town Hall. One item in the ter- entertainment will be a play entitled Union Depot. About 50 characters are represented. The first rehearsal was held Thursday evening. I tried to find out what this play was, and I think it's a a play called Union Depot that was unpublished, but written by Gene Fowler, Joe Laurie Jr., and Douglas Durkin. The basis for the Warner Brothers movie Union Depot that was released in 1932, starring Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Joan Blondell. The next section is called Town Affairs. The the sharp contest for some town officers and the license question make it certain that every voter knows that the annual town meeting will come off according to schedule time next Monday, March 15th. The polls will be open for your opinions at 8 a.m. and may be closed against opinions at 1 p.m. This space of time relates exclusively to the election of town officers and cannot be infringed on by other town business. The business following an election of officers can be transacted more easily and intelligently if the voters are prepared. As a means to this end, read and ponder the report of the Finance Committee mailed to every voter. It is a short business-like statement of existing conditions, upon which is based a wise, conservative recommendation for the future. Curtailment is the vital word to keep the rate of taxation down. This is correct, but just where taxpayers may differ. Then there's somewhat of a lengthy discussion of some of the items. And the last paragraph reads, The annual town reports have been distributed, and much useful information can be gathered from it as a basis of action for town meeting and as a confirmation of the report of the Finance Committee. It is growing in size every year, as well as importance, and contains 26 pages. The most important recommendation is that of the superintendent of schools in urging the consolidation of the Stony Brook and Namnasset schools in a new two-room building at some central point. The population for the Namnasset school is at one side of the district and the schoolhouse at the other. Like many other locations, the center of territory was equilibrium and not population. Ought to have a school to teach common sense in, and then locations would not be so changeable. New Nabnasset School, which was what we now call Old Nam, was not built until uh, uh, 1922, in the uh, spring of 1922, I believe. 
The next section is called Forge Village. Miss Olive Josephine Pine passed away at her home, Pine Ridge, Tuesday morning after a brief illness. She had an operation for appendicitis Friday of last week and was doing well as well as could be expected. Monday afternoon, she began to fail. Meningitis set in. Then it was a question of a few hours. Everything was done for her that a physician and friends could do, but it was of no avail. Her early death has cast a gloom over her friends and classmates, and heartfelt sympathy goes out from everyone to the sorrowing parents and only sister. Uh, sometimes, but not today, this is a quote, sometime, but not today, they will see and clearly understand that God knew the best. Owing to the illness of Reverend Thomas Fisher, Lenten services at the St. Andrew's Mission House have been omitted. There are a number of cases of measles among the children, and there are many vacant seats in the classrooms. Miss Blaisdale has returned to her school duties after a severe attack of the measles. Schools close Friday for the annual vacation of two weeks and will open March 29th. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending March 13th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.